So now we're going to talk about how vertebrates actually evolved. So um, we're going to start, we're going to just do like a basic overview. So um, about 470 million years ago was going to be when the first vertebrates came to be. And they were going to be these jawless fish that we'll talk about in a second. So um, they didn't have a jaw, which obviously was not very advantageous. So fish that had a jaw were going to be who followed. And then they became the big creatures in the sea. Um, then the big thing that happened evolutionarily was going to be that transition from the sea to the land. So you've got amphibians, which are going to kind of be that in-between group. And then the reptiles came along because the reptiles were a lot less dependent on water than the amphibians were. And then that came um, followed by birds and then finally mammals. So those are going to be how the vertebrate um, evolution is going to be happening. So what we're going to do is start talking first about the first vertebrates, which are going to be fishes. And fishes is grammatically correct as long as you're talking about more than one species. So kind of a crazy number, over half of all the vertebrates out there are fishes, which is kind of crazy, right? Um, and fishes are going to have a couple of characteristics that they're going to have in common with one another. First one is having a vertebral column, right? Um, now this can be made of bone or cartilage. Second one is that they're going to have jaws, and they're also going to have paired appendages. So that means that they're going to have, you know, two pectoral fins and those types of things so that they can actually maneuver better to get away from predators, to get food, and to find a mate. Um, the only fishes that don't have a jaw is going to be a group called the agnathans, and natho, G-N-A-T-H-O, actually means jaw. And you know in Latin, if we put A in front of something, it means they don't have it, right? Um, so we'll talk about them in a little bit too. Um, another thing that all fishes are going to have in common is going to be gills because they're going to be living in the water. And so gills are very, very efficient at getting oxygen out of the water. And that's the whole purpose of them. Um, then you, they're also going to have what's called single loop circulation, which means that their blood is always flowing in one direction. You don't have any kind of backwashing like that. And then the last thing is that fishes tend to have nutritional deficiencies. And what that means is even if their body has all of the components to make a certain amino acid, they may not be able to do it. Their body just doesn't know how to do it. And that means they have to get those amino acids from their bodies, or from, from their bodies, from their diet. Um, and so that's going to be another thing that all fishes are going to have in common. Okay, so now we're going to kind of go through their evolution and how they came to be. So the first fishes were called ostracoderms. So derm, you know, means skin. Ostraco is talking about shell. And if you look at this picture, this is a picture of an ostracoderm right here. So you can see that very, very armored plates around them, um, bottom feeders. They've got the, their uh, mouth on the bottom of their body, the eyes on the top of their head. Um, so they didn't really move very efficiently. They were very heavy, so they weren't a super successful group, right? Um, so the big issue they had is they were heavy and they didn't have a jaw. So the next thing that was going to happen evolutionarily was going to be the evolution of a jaw. And the way that scientists have found in the fossil record that the jaw kind of came to be, well first here's a fish that doesn't have jaws, the, those agnathans we were talking about. Um, but here in this picture, no not this one, this one. Um, you can see that um, this is how scientists think that this happened. So you originally had a fish that didn't have any jaws and they have these little rods that are in their gill area that hold up their gills. They're called gill arches. And so they hold the gills open so that they're getting maximum exposure to that water when it's coming through to give them oxygen. And what they found in the fossil record is that those rods have actually migrated forward and eventually became the jaw. So that's how the evolution of the jaw actually worked. Now having a jaw is obviously going to be extremely beneficial because that's going to allow them to catch prey more easily um, and to defend themselves more easily. And one jaw that's really, really advanced is going to be these guys, which are going to be sharks. <clears throat> now sharks have what's called a protrudable jaw. So if you've ever seen like a great white biting into something, you might notice that it looks like its mouth curls back and you can see its gums. And what that actually is, is their protrudable jaw coming out. I think in this picture, this next one, you might be able to see it a little better. Yeah, so you can kind of see how it looks like it's coming forward. So what happens is, let's say you've got prey and the shark is going after the prey, what's going to happen is that prey is going to try and conserve energy and just stay enough out of the way that they can, you know, use a burst at the end if they need to. And what's going to happen is they're gauging how much that shark can lunge forward and, and bite them. 
But what they're not taking into account is that sharks have that protrudable jaw that actually is going to lunge at them even more forward, and so they can catch the prey a little bit more easily. So that's a really, really nice thing to have is like a top predator. Okay, um, now going back to the notes, the next big evolution um, milestone was going to be the rise of active swimmers. So <clears throat> looking at this picture, you can definitely see that sharks are designed to be in the water, right? They've got that torpedo shape to them. It's kind of tapered at both ends. And they've got all these different fins that are going to have different functions. So you've got that dorsal fin, and the dorsal fin is going to help them to not go from one side or the other. It's not just for scary movies. Um, then you've got the pectoral fins. And if you kind of look at these guys, you can see that like where an airplane kind of shape came from, right? They look very similar. Um, so the pectoral fins are kind of like the wings of the airplane, right? And so what they can do is they can actually move them up and down like this, and that will help them to change direction, right? And they can also go, you know, up and down like that. So that's going to help them change direction. And then you've got this big fin back here, and that's going to be called a caudal fin. And the whole point of a caudal fin is to actually provide them with propulsion, right, and push them through. So it's really interesting to look at different fishes and see how they have these different um, fins in, in relation to their body. Um, there's a great fish called a thresher shark, and this is what a thresher shark looks like right here. Look at the size of that caudal fin, and as a result, look at what they can do. They can jump way far out of the water because they have that massive propulsion from that fin. Okay. Now another thing about sharks, did we, uh, yeah, we'll talk about those in a sec. Okay, so um, sharks are going to become the top predators, obviously, because they're going to be extremely advanced and just designed for what they need to do. So a th couple things about sharks, they're going to be in a class that's called chondrichthys. So ichthys means fish. Cond, C-H-O-N-D, means cartilage. So these are going to be the cartilaginous fish. Um, <clears throat> so these are going to be the first vertebrates that actually had teeth. They give birth to live young. And um, they also are going to be in the same category as stingrays and skates. Skates look just like a stingray. Now, sharks have something really cool about them that actually helps them to swim more efficiently. And that's going to be what you see here, if I can get this to come up. Um, and that's called dermal denticles. So dermal means skin, denticles are talking about teeth. So they actually have like these teeth on their skin and you'll see this when you dissect the shark. And so if you go in one direction on their skin, it feels very smooth. But if you go in the other direction, it feels like sandpaper and sometimes it could even cut you. And that's due to these dermal denticles. And those are there to give them maximum efficiency when they're swimming. So if you've ever swum in a pool, you may have noticed like if you move, there's like a swirl that comes behind you and at first it's kind of pulling at you and then it kind of pushes you forward. That's what these do. So if you, you picture them swimming, right, and you've got this dermal denticle, the water is going to go over it and then come under and push them forward. And so it gives them a lot more swimming power with a lot less energy. And um, scientists are actually doing this on the bottom of boats. They're recreating this to make them use way less fuel and get places with a lot less energy. So it's really interesting. So other organisms that are going to be in this group are going to be stingrays. So here's a picture of a stingray here. Um, and also you've got your manta rays. So there's a picture of a manta ray there, um, spotted eagle ray, which is another type of stingray. So those are all going to be in that category of chondrichthys because they're all cartilaginous fish. <clears throat> Now, another group is going to be the bony fishes, and those are called osteichthys. And that makes sense, right? You've got ichthys, which is fish, osteo, which is bone, right? So bony fishes. Um, and they evolved at about the same time as sharks. It depends on who you talk to. If you talk to a shark person, they'll say sharks evolve first. If you talk to a fish person, they'll probably say fishes evolve first, whatever. Um, so what they're going to do is they're going to have, um, actually, class osteichthys sometimes is called a super class osteichthys. And then it's divided into two subcategories called Sarcopterygii and Actinopterygii. So Sarcopterygii are going to be lobe fin fishes, which means their fins don't have any rays in them. They're very floppy. And then you've got Actinopterygii, which are going to be ray fin fishes, which actually have bony rays within their fins. So I can show you some pictures to explain what I'm talking about. So in this first picture, you've got Sarcopterygii, and so you can see those very fleshy um, fins that really aren't going to be very pointy or anything, compared to, more commonly, Actinopterygii, where you see all those little rays sticking up, right? So that's going to be the big difference between them. Okay, so there's going to be a couple of really important characteristics about um, bony fishes that are going to be important adaptations that they have.
<clears throat> first thing is going to be what's called a swim bladder. And a swim bladder is going to be a little sac that's inside them that they can fill with air and that helps them to maintain their buoyancy. So you can totally tell if a fish has a well-developed swim bladder because they can stay perfectly still and they're not sinking or floating. They're just kind of standing there looking at you. Um, and then ones that don't have a well-developed swim bladder are the ones that are constantly moving around. Now, some sharks have a swim bladder, but um, what they usually have is a very, very big and oily liver, and that helps them with buoyancy. Um, another thing that um, fishes are going to have is a lateral line system. So if you've ever looked at, like, the side of a fish, and I can actually go back uh, in this picture, and we can actually see it in this guy. Uh, no, you can't see it that well. Okay, so in this picture you can see it. You've ever noticed on the like side of a fish there's like a line that goes all the way down it? And so that lateral line is filled with cilia, and those cilia are really sensitive, and they can sense um, direction, gravity, speed, all sorts of different things, prey in the water. And um, sharks can have that too, but what sharks are also going to have is what's called um, the ampullae of Lorenzini. And if you look at this picture of the shark, you see how it looks like the nose has kind of freckles? Those are going to be concentrated areas of cilia, and they are super sensitive, and that's how they can sense, like, a dead fish in the water, a dying fish in the water, like a couple miles away kind of stuff. Um, but it is also to their detriment. So people have been trying to keep great white sharks in, in captivity forever. And they can't because the sharks go crazy because of all the pumps and the electrical currents that they have. And so uh, great whites are known to commit suicide. They'll just ram their head in the side until they kill themselves because they can't handle all of that electromagnetic spectrum. It's just too much for them. So you'll see that when we dissect them in the lab. Okay, so going back to the bony fishes. So we've got our swim bladder, which is right here. Then you've got the lateral line. And the last thing that they have is this thing called an operculum. And an operculum is pretty cool because it allows a fish to stay still while it's actually breathing. So the operculum opens and that pulls water over their gills and then it can close. And then it can pull water over their gills and close. A shark doesn't have that. So a shark is what, what's called a ram ventilator and that means they have to swim with their mouth open all the time and that's pushing water over their gills to breathe. So when you transport a shark you actually, actually have to put like a hose in to kind of push water over their gills so that they um, don't suffocate. Okay, so back to the notes, see where we are. Okay, we'll actually stop here and then in the next one we'll go into the class Amphibia.